Welcome back to The Pursuit Podcast. I'm your host, Jessica Rose. And every Tuesday in December, we're bringing you a new episode where we talk about some aspect of open source. Today, we've got a very special guest, and we're going to be talking about what it feels like and what the experience is of managing and maintaining a large open source project. I'm here today with Hi, I'm Dan Abramov. I work at Facebook and I help maintain uh, React. So React, that's just a little tiny project that nobody uses, right? Right. <laughs> uh, React is a JavaScript library for built-in user interfaces. We use it at Facebook uh, and it's also used by other companies like Twitter, Airbnb, Pinterest, and many smaller companies. We use it in, in my work as well. And Everybody's a really big fan of it. But when you've got an incredible amount of use, what's that like? What's it like as a maintainer? Um, I think it's uh, it's definitely humbling. I think it's interesting how you bump into all kinds of edge cases you don't really anticipate. And you kind of start anticipating them eventually. So it's like if there is some corner case that you don't think anybody would hit, it like somebody will probably hit it because if you have so many uh, dependents, people just like to very strange things with your API. <laughs> so it's easier to accidentally make breaking changes. Uh, you have to be very watchful of that. That sounds really stressful, but also kind of freeing that you've almost got testing via mass use. Yeah, but I mean, we don't just release things and hope that they will work. The, the way it's structured is that Obviously, we use React at Facebook a lot. When people speak about Facebook, they usually think about Facebook.com, but Facebook is actually like a, a bunch of like maybe dozens uh, or even hundreds of small internal tools, uh, tools for advertisers. Some of them are really complicated, complex interactive forms. Uh, some are native apps, uh, React native apps, mixed apps. And so there is a lot of surface area. And the way we test things is that we usually, before doing the open source release, we try to, so we try to keep the master relatively uh, stable, even though you're not supposed to use React for master, but we try to. So like every two weeks or every week, roughly, we sync the code of master into Facebook. And this runs, uh, we, we already have like about 2,000 or so unit tests in React open source repo itself. But we also have, I don't know, like maybe uh, 30, maybe 50,000, I'm not sure, but a lot of unit tests uh, internally for products that also rely on React. And so we also have manual uh kind of test cases where we go through the products and verify that nothing broke. So when we change something, it's our response. It's not the product team's responsibility, but it's our responsibility to change things in the products and to make sure that they work with the latest version of React. So Facebook has a giant mono repo. So like it's a single repository for everything, which sounds a bit confusing to people, but it actually works really well in practice. And this also means that Products can't depend on different versions of React. So we update it for all products together in a, in a single go. And so this kind of coverage and this kind of testing gives us confidence that if we didn't break something internally, it's likely that we won't break too much externally when we do release. But of course, like mistakes happen. So you're in a really interesting position as a maintainer for the open source project where you've got the opportunity to sort of check and make sure both through very, very careful testing and very rigorous standards, but also through using it internally at Facebook to make sure that, you know what, this is probably going to work for people externally as well. Yeah. So on an average day, how many bug reports do you get to look at? How many issues are raised? How much time is spent on, mm -hmm. yeah, weird things going a little bit wrong? Yeah. I don't think it's too overwhelming. It really depends on the day. <laughs> I think usually we get about two issues a day or maybe three issues. If there is a new release, then we can get like five or 10 or so um, a day. And we, we haven't historically been very good at dealing with issues. So like the way we treat them is usually we are aware of the bugs anyway. So, um, if something is uh, really pressing, we 
know about it, both from GitHub and from internal bug reports, and we have to fix them ASAP so that uh, the products uh, could work. So we fix high priority issues uh, pretty fast, but then there's this uh, longer trail of things that are maybe slightly broken, but there's good workarounds. And so those tend to pile on until we have some cohesive kind of vision for how to solve them. So sometimes we kind of wait for a few related bugs to appear for us to understand how to solve them all together in a good way. And so we kind of let, we try to respond to issues uh, as much as we can, but we also let them just sit there for a while and then kind of do a pass over them once in every few months and clean them up. So for example, we recently released React 16, which is the newest stable version. And I did a pass, uh, so I think there was about 600 open issues at the time. So I closed about 300 of them. Nice. Which some of them were just like support requests that have already been answered by somebody, but the person didn't close the issue. Uh, Some of them were bugs that happened to be solved because we just knew that these are problems and we, we forgot to close the bugs. Some of them were documentation things that we fixed. We moved documentation into a different repository just a few weeks ago to kind of separate the code from the documentation. And now we have about 280 or something like this issues. Oh, that's, that's a lot. That's got to feel really daunting to look at it, but that's a lot less terrifying than it could be. Yeah, but it's also like the surface area of React itself is pretty large. So like it, it there are mul- multiple components uh, that are like some of them are only related to tests and React apps. Some of them are only related to React Native. Some of them are related to React DOM. Just like there is a lot of surface area. And a lot of these are not like bug reports as in really a bug, but more like discussions, proposals, uh, feature requests. So we try not to close these too aggressively because they help encourage healthy discussion and there are some interesting ideas floating around. But it also means that we need to be comfortable with just having lots of open issues and just dealing with that. So kind of finding the zen of open issues. Yeah. (laughs) Or just not looking at them too much. So you've got all of these issues to cope with being open. And you it sounds like you've got a really healthy view on, well, you know, this is just how that works. This is okay. Uh, I think it, it's, it's more like I just gave up on this. <laughs> it's not like I wish there was a better way to do it, but yeah, we, we, we can come up with anything. It's just too hard. Okay. So it's sort of the, the acceptance stage where you're like, this is the way it is. Yeah. We have to make our peace. <laughs> yeah. What kind of advice would you have for somebody else who's in a similar situation? You'll say, hey, you know, I'm also maintaining a large open source project or even a smaller medium sized. I maintain this project. I've got tons of open issues. How do I make my peace with it? Or how do I, how do I start to battle them? I guess I can say what works for me. So like, I generally get anxious when I see lots of issues that don't have descriptive titles. So I try to tidy them up a little bit. I use labels. So I, I tag them as bug reports, or fish requests, uh, and the part of the code base that they're related to. And I think even that helps me kind of look at them less anxiously just because I see how they're related to each other. And another thing I found valuable is, so this is actually, uh, I learned this from my colleague on the team, from Sebastian. So what he does is he creates so-called umbrella issues, which is just an issue to keep track of a certain kind of issues. So like there may be an umbrella for everything that has to be done before 16 release. And so it's like a giant checklist with 70 items on it. Or it could be an umbrella of all known bugs related to DOM inputs. And it's just like a checklist with links to specific issues that describe specific problems. And this kind of gives you a bird's eye view on what's going on in the repository and helps define areas of focus and find people who are willing to understand the bigger picture a little bit and own that or area of focus. Because Often the problem is that there are so many isolated bug reports, it's hard to see the bigger picture behind them. And you can try isolated fixes, but miss like some solution that could make 
a whole class of problems disappear. So it's helpful to group related things together just so you can keep the big picture in mind. So it sounds like it's a combination of getting organized and applying some structure internally or in a visible way on project. Here are a bunch of labels. Here's how we know it. But also with the team you're working on saying, you know what, here's how we'll get together and discuss these and see where they go and see where they fit. Yeah. And I mean, a lot of it is also kind of very ad hoc. It's just if I remember some bug because it keeps reappearing, then it's probably important. If I don't remember it, then it's probably less important because it's just, if I don't see it often enough, repeated in different issues, then it's some isolated edge case. But if there is a common theme, it'll stay in my mind and I'll fix it eventually or somebody else will get to it. So I think that's something that we don't talk about often enough in open source is the amount of work that is kind of done on gut feel. They say, do you know what? I've seen this issue a lot. I've seen this edge case a number of times. I feel like this is going to be meaningful to to try and mop up. Yeah. Uh, I mean, this is more or less how we operate at Facebook internally as well, is there is no top-down directive to do anything. You're supposed to kind of come up with things you think would be valuable, and hopefully uh, you can show that they are valuable eventually. Uh, So I think we definitely don't impose too much structure because that can also affect people negatively and prevent them from just doing random things that they think would be good, but process could get in the way. But it's a balance. That sounds both freeing and gently terrifying for me. (laughs) Like, hey, work on what you think is important to be like, oh my. (laughs) Yeah. So you mentioned your team. You're in a really great situation where you've got this huge open source project to maintain, but you've got a really brilliant team behind you. Can you talk a little bit about the size or the makeup of the team and how you distribute tasks for maintaining the open source project? So the React team is about, I think, six or seven people. So these are all people who are working on React full time, but that doesn't mean that they work necessarily on just the open source repo. So it's the React team is responsible for React itself, as well as syncing it to Facebook internally every few weeks, as well as helping product developers at Facebook resolve any issues that might be related to React, as well as sometimes writing documentation and a bunch of things. So we don't really have any specific way to split tasks, I guess. The process that we follow is We have a weekly sync, so every week we meet for an hour, in my case remotely because I work from London, but most of the team is in uh, in Menlo Park in America. But they do that in the afternoon for you then, right? You don't have to wake up at 3 or 4 in the morning. Yeah, uh, I think it's 10 a.m. for them and 6 p.m. for me. Oh, that's not terrible. Yeah, and there is also another person on the team who's in London, Dominic. And so... We meet for an hour, and I think we've changed the format of the meeting a couple of times. But these days, we just briefly mention what we've been working on last week and what we think we might work on next week. And also, anybody can raise any discussion topics. So we have like a rolling list of things we want to discuss, and we try to get to each of them. If some topic doesn't make it, we just move it to the next week. So that's how we, and like anybody can decide that. I think this area of focus is valuable and I'm going to work on this. That sounds like a pretty laid back way to distribute tasks and to make sure everybody's getting stuff done and fitting together well. So you've talked about how keeping these open conversations in issues, conversations around potential features and how there's quite a lot of edge cases that crop up. I'm really interested in chatting to you about an issue that I think is challenging for a lot of maintainers of open source projects. How and when do you say no? Yeah, that's that's a good question. We had, I think we actually say we haven't been really good at saying no. I think we just kind of not say anything in these cases. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I'm not saying that this is good. And um, I, I think that might be a really common approach to it, especially on larger open source projects, though. Yeah, I guess. Like the problem for us is that it takes a lot of time to to explain why something is not a good idea. We have all this context into, you know, different uses of React and the bigger picture, but it's harder to convey to people who just want a specific bad feature implemented. So what we think we might do is 
we might introduce some process there. So we might follow projects like Rust, Ember, Yarn, and introduce an RFC process in the future. So that if we did that, we would kind of formalize the thinking process that we go through. So like whenever we think about a feature, we think, is this feature consistent with other APIs? Is there a bigger solution that would solve a bigger class of problems and not just this particular problem? Is there a smaller solution that is more specific and easier to implement? How well does it work with XYZ and so on? And so if we kind of formalize all these things into an RFC process, that may help. So yeah, I think if if a project has trouble articulating why something isn't a good idea, it's great to document how you think what is a good idea and what is not. And we already have a document about this. I don't think it's very visible. We might maybe make it more visible, but I think we stopped getting some questions after we wrote a document called Design Principles. So this is something that's on React website. You can look it up and it kind of explains how we think about features and why some features fit or don't fit into React. So that's almost the opportunity to say no in advance, very politely. But but it's also a way to, it's not necessarily about saying no, but more about steering people towards the kind of thinking that we apply. So maybe their original proposal doesn't fly for some reasons, but understanding these principles will help them come up with a different proposal that actually fits well. That sounds like a really interesting way to better communicate with users of your project that this is what what's important right now. These This is the wider vision. And that's really interesting. So what kind of advice would you offer someone who's who's got who's just starting an open source project and they're they're bright-eyed and bushy-tailed or they've got a medium-sized project that's growing a little bit or you've got somebody who's got a huge open source project and they want to know how to handle it what kinds of different advice would you give to folks at each point in in this sort of ecosystem on how to get by mm, Well I guess when it's just that and you just want to have users right so at that point, it's it's valuable that just to talk to people. I think that's something I didn't realize when I was starting. It's just you can publish a project and nobody's going to notice because it's just uh, not used by anyone and you don't use any channels to promote it. So it helps to uh, kind of establish some kind of presence for yourself. So that might be like a Twitter account or uh, a blog or something, some way to talk to people. Twitter works really well for this because it's it's not just one-to-many communication, but it's many-to-many. You get to know the people who may find your project useful and you can talk to them and get their feedback and come back with like better ideas and maybe find collaborators. So I think that's a healthy first stage just, and also just learning how to market their projects. So like, does it have documentation? If it doesn't, then nobody can use it. Uh, and as soon this... as you said, does it have documentation? I just broke into a cold sweat. <laughs> uh, the number of new projects that don't is a little bit scary. Yeah, it's like nobody, if you're already established, you can kind of get away with having no docs for ah! some obscure like <laughs> experiments and stuff. And people will pick it up anyway and kind of maybe contribute documentation. But if nobody knows you, then there is no community trust that you can use for this. So, and yeah, well, you, you have to document things. Come on. Uh, so <laughs> Thank you. start with good documentation and it helps to have some screenshots, uh, like try to learn what's good for Twitter. So like I try to use code screenshots, maybe small GIFs, something that is uh, like people like to, uh, people enjoy liking and sharing, but also just talk to people and try to solve solve your problems and maybe they will match somebody else's problems. I think as the project grows more popular, it's easy to get trapped into the cycle of feedback and kind of trying to make it even more popular and spend a lot a lot of effort competing with other projects and trying to one up one each other. And that's I think that gets frustrating after a while and like it's a cycle that never stops. You just go out of the loop for like a few weeks and then there's uh, some other projects that is trying to like take your users and that's fine. And I think what you need to do is just to when the project becomes popular, I think it's healthy to be able to distance yourself from it a little, a little bit. And most importantly, if you don't use it yourself, then 
you're probably not the best uh, maintainer. So you should find people who, who are sending good pull requests and who seem to understand the bigger picture behind your project, not just like, I want this feature implemented or something like this, but more like, what is the end game for this project? What is the natural kind of end state that you're trying to uncover? So if you approach a project more like a thing you're searching for, not the thing you create, you have this idea of what it's supposed to be, and you're just looking for the right way to manifest that idea. So if you approach the project this way, I think you will notice that some people don't just try to add things to it, but try to steer it towards uh, the ideal kind of state. And when you find people like this, just give them commit access and say, hey, now you're the maintainer. And (laughs) it reminds me a little bit of, if you remember in Tom Sawyer, there was this episode at the very beginning when he was painting the fence and pretending that it's uh, it's so fun and got somebody else to paint the fence because like uh, <laughs> it seemed like a, a great way to spend your time. I kind of feel like contributing to open source is a little bit like this. So it's obviously like great for your career and it gives you recognition and it's fun and it's engaging, but it's also like a lot of effort that eventually for some projects might not be worthwhile for you. On the other hand, there are all these people who want to like have their five minutes of fame and who want to have this kind of impact on some existing projects that they use. And I think it's good that you can pass that over, but you also need to be clear that they should do the same. So like eventually they'll get tired of the project and they should look for other people who use it and who have a good vision for it and uh, pass it on. So be willing to pass them a paintbrush, but also warn them that maybe that fence will get boring after a while. Yeah. (laughs) I really loved what you said about and looking at an open source project as a destination or a process, really sort of looking at it as more of a shared journey than a creative work. You're not, you're, yeah, you're going on a trip together. You're not making a painting together. There is this poster on Facebook offices. And I mean, I'm not, I'm not a fan of uh, motivational posters in general, but it says uh, that the journey is 1% finished. And that's kind of how we think about React and other projects is uh, like a lot of people, when they say React, they mean the thing that lives in on the GitHub. But when we think about React, we think about where we want to bring it. And it's just as far as away, uh, as far away as it used to be like two years ago. So you talked about feedback and how Twitter was really valuable to give you an extra channel in addition to looking at the issues on GitHub. Are there any other feedback avenues that have been useful for you or useful for the React project? And what are the kinds of channels would you recommend folks look at who are maintaining their own projects? There is a good talk by Christopher Shadow called How, uh, how to be Successful at Open Source. I think that's what it, what it was called. He had some advice that I liked, which is kind of extrapolate that from what React team was doing. So Christopher worked for a while on React team, and he he was instrumental in starting React Native project and some other projects at Facebook. And so what he observed is that React, when it kind of started, React didn't have any specific, I mean, I wasn't there, but uh, when it started, but the team didn't try to use all channels at once. So the important thing that you found is that it's it's valuable if you just pick a few channels, but you are there. So it doesn't matter which channel those are. It can be Twitter, it can be Sacroflow, it can be Discord, it can be Gitter, it can be whatever. As long as there is a place where people can find you and where you're present most of the time. And for different people on the React team, these were different channels. So like uh, like Sophie Alpert was hanging out on Stackoflow mostly and IRC. And I think like Pete Hunt probably, uh, he was replying a lot on Reddit and Hacking News and so on. So there's just pick the channels, like don't be everywhere. Pick two channels that matter to you and use them. But in terms of like which channels can you pick from, I think if you're like a medium-sized project, 
Stack Overflow is obviously uh, something you should pay attention to. But for smaller projects, I think Twitter is perfect. Like not getting your Twitter account for a project that's only valuable if the project is large, but just kind of establishing a presence for yourself and uh, following people who create similar things and engaging in discussions, this kind of stuff. And that gives you the extra benefit of building your profile while you answer questions and help people out. Yeah. Dan, thank you so much for joining us today. Just before we go, do you have any advice you might want to share with someone who's not maintaining a giant project or maybe not maintaining any project yet? Is there something you'd like to say to somebody who's just now looking to get into hope and source, maybe get into their very first project? Yeah, I think the you don't have to create a project to like do valuable work. I think often it's actually counterproductive to create a project because uh, this way you increase the entropy between projects and you kind of like fragment the community. So I think it's healthy to try to use or contribute to an existing project if you can, unless you're doing something totally different than others. And I think the best way to get started is not to kind of find projects uh, and just randomly like search for issues. But the best way to get started is just to like fix something that you use. So if you depend on a library in your like work project and has a bug and you try to work around it and there are some workarounds you don't understand on Stack Overflow or something, uh, just remember that this is just code. Like somebody wrote it and it's probably not much more complex than the code you write daily. So just find where that code is and try to fix it. And your first pull request might not get accepted, but it will give you some confidence that you can do things and eventually you learn how to do them in a way that people will want to accept those contributions. Yeah, start out by fixing the things that annoy you day to day and don't be discouraged if it doesn't work right away. That's fantastic advice. Thanks so much for listening. Come on back next week. We've got an episode coming out December 26th. And this episode's going to be looking at what it's like to leave your open source project, to have something you've cared about, something you've built, something you've maintained all this time, what it's like when it's time to let that go. 